Hello and welcome to the 11th episode, Karl Marx's 18th premiere of Louis Napoleon Reading Group series. Today is Thursday the 20th of August 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. We continue with Chapter 4, The Rise of Louis Bonaparte. Today's episode was edited a couple of weeks in advance as I am actually now on my holidays camping on as many remote Irish islands as the corona will allow, so I've got no new patrons to announce. I'll give you all, if any of you good people actually exist, a shout out next week. If you like extra patron only episodes and live streams, perhaps you too could sign up for only $5 a month. Okay, to the discussion. Last week we had gone halfway through the rise of Louis Bonaparte, chapter four, and we'd just gone through the part Marx was talking about how the bourgeois, the party of order, started condemning everything as socialism. You know, you want to have a train, that's socialism. If you want to have workers' rights, socialism. If you want to do anything, socialism. So in that line, which sounds so familiar to like you know, our politics of today, everything is goddamn socialism, even if it's just not. I suppose that's the best way of saying it. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to read a little bit here and see how we get on. Let's finish off this, this paragraph here. Thus, by now stigmatizing as socialistic what it had previously extolled as liberal, the bourgeoisie confessed that its own interests dictate that it should be delivered from the danger of its own rule. That to restore tranquility in the country, its bourgeois parliament must, first of all, be given its quietus, that to preserve its social power intact, its political power must be broken, that the individual bourgeois can continue to exploit the other classes and to enjoy undisturbed property, family, religion and order only on condition that their class be condemned, along with the other classes, to like political nullity, that in order to save its purse, it must forfeit the crown, and the sword that is to safeguard it must at the same time be hung over its own head as a sword of Damocles. I think the the probably the interesting comment there is that this is like in the interest of the individual bourgeois, not so much in the interest of the class as a class, right? Like it's as atomized bourgeois, it's in their interest, but as a class for themselves, it's not. Is, is that what he's saying? I don't know if I'd say that because it's also in their interest as a class. It's in their it, social interest, but not their. It's in their interest. social interest, right? Yes, yeah. that there is, yeah. when, and it's it's very important here that when we see when there is a clash between politics and society, that it's the social that dominates over the politics. This is an important thing when it comes to like Mao saying, you know, that politics is primary to social organization. That's kind of Mao's line, isn't it? Politics the, the... and command. I don't yeah. know. He, I don't know if he means this as a description of reality or as something like normative. That should be the case. I, I don't even think it should be a normative. It should be normative. right, right. But just as a description of the world, it's false. Yeah. So by meaning normative, we we mean like because normative. I have to I had to look up normative oh, about five hundred times. Like it yeah. should be, like it should be in command. Uh, yeah, I'm not like, sure if he's saying politics is in command or politics should be in command. I would say that neither. Like that, the social life politics right. is an epiphenomenon of social life. So what I was thinking of when I when I made that earlier comment, which was, you know, not correct uh, as looking at one part of the paragraph and not the whole thing is I was thinking about the the German bourgeoisie and how they sort of developed after all this debacle of 1848 and everything without political power, but very much had their interests safeguarded, right? So, like, a lot of people say that the weakness of the republic that followed the German Empire was partially due to this kind of politically atrophied bourgeois development in Germany. So that's just what I had in mind when I read this this paragraph. 
I think it was listener and viewer Jara Handala that pointed out that around the time that Marx was writing, Marx, I guess, was writing about a change in the word, how socialism was used, that this was a sort of, sort of entering the current political state or the current political climate, you might say, like a, a long-term climate trend where socialism became associated with statism rather than with, you know, anarchy. And that, yeah, I, I guess normally when I think of the 18th premiere, I think of what's being expressed in the latter half of this paragraph that bourgeois governance ends up taking these like different forms based on, I don't know, the social strength of the bourgeoisie and the political strength that they've like developed over time. And that a lot of times the bourgeoisie are compelled to allow other forms than the one, you know, you would expect from a perfect typology of like, you know, the end of history where capitalism means liberal democracy, QED kind of thing. Like it's kind of consonant with like the varieties of capitalism school, I guess you might say. Yeah, exactly. What's this varieties of capitalism school, Kyle? It was just like a academic movement that happened, I think, starting in the 90s, I want to say, which was like investigating more closely the different political economic forms of capitalism. You know, it's kind of an outshoot of the collapse of any kind of like Soviet studies or like Soviet or socialist country studies, these people basically didn't have work anymore. So they ended up doing kind of like comparative political economic studies of different capitalist countries. And so people had like a more, they had more attention and more awareness that capitalism was not a monolith and that there was actually more sort of of these variations that Esri was describing. Like uh, Puya pointed out that uh, Saudi Arabia is an absolute monarchy and you wouldn't say Saudi Arabia is non-capitalist, you know, or something like that because yeah, yeah, exactly. of bourgeois governance. And similarly, this is also a check in the direction of people that are world systems theorists and therefore look at 20th century, quote, socialism as being de facto forms of capitalism just because they're situated in, in the world, uh, in a capitalist world, or people that think the Soviet Union was a form of capitalism. Again, I'm on the record saying I don't think that. But if you did, you know, it would be, it's consonant with this way of thinking. Okay, let's take the next wee bit here. In the domain of the interests of the general citizenry, the National Assembly showed itself so unproductive that, for example, the discussions on the Paris-Avignon Railway, which began in the winter of 1850, were still not ripe for conclusion on December 2nd, 1851. Gee, that sounds familiar. Where it did not repress or pursue a reactionary course, it was stricken with incurable barrenness. While Bonaparte's ministry partially took the initiative in framing laws in the spirit of the party of order, and partly even outdid that party's harshness in their execution and administration, he, on the other hand, sought by childishly silly proposals to win popularity, to bring out his opposition to the National Assembly, and to hint at a secret reserve that was only temporarily prevented by conditions from making its hidden treasures available to the French people. Such was the proposal to decree an increase in pay of four sous a day to the non-commissioned officers. Such was the proposal of an honor system loan bank for the workers. Money as a gift and money as a loan. It was with prospects such as these that he hoped to lure the masses. Donations and loans, the financial science of the lumpen proletariat, whether of high degree or low, is restricted to this. Such were the only springs Bonaparte knew how to set in action. Never has a pretender speculated more stupidly on the stupidity of the masses. Right, that line kind of struck me a little bit. I think the, the word stupidity of the masses is a bit harsh, but we, we want to, <laughs> more than a little bit harsh, but, you know, was it stupid? 
I think it may be a reference to these sort of silly proposals. Like, this is not actually good governance in any sense, but it was politically effective. I mean, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think, you know, opening a loan bank that works on the honor system is very intelligent as a governance principle. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that may be what he's referring to. <laughs> now, first of all, like, I think I think the speculation on the stupidity of the masses thing is Marx is really emphasizing the stupidity of such speculation. If Marx thought the masses were stupid, that would really cut against the thrust of his worldview and belief system. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's kind of complicated because he lays this at the feet of the lumpen proletariat, which, you know, obviously Marx had no love of. Right. Do you think that's what he means by the masses? It may be, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, that's, 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 I, uh, that's a fair reading. I would be interested to maybe, like, come back to this with Var and just, like, see what the German is. Yeah, uh, he, he says it right before. Yeah, okay. a financial yeah. science of the lump and proletariat. So that's a fair, that's a very fair reading. Oh, thank you, Erica. Oh, hell yeah, Erica. Do you speak German, Carl? Erica speaks German. She's always knocking our uh, German pronunciations. I do Duolingo for German. So unlike French, I take exception to it being pointed out that I also don't know German. Yeah, it looks very, very similar to the English that we have here. Yeah. Ni hat yeah. ein pretender platter auf die Plattheit den Massen speculiert. There you go. I think it's actually word for word. Never has a yeah. pretender speculated on the stupidity of the masses. This is probably a supervised uh, translation. Marxist.org has a tendency to have supervised translations by some of the classical figures in social democracy. Often angles will often be angles, like looking over the English translations. I think I've said this before, but I think this is a later translation. But he also talks about, you know, honor system loan bank for the workers. And as Mike Duncan pointed out to Matt Chrisman, when Matt Chrisman was trying to be like, dude, you know, like Louis Napoleon's Trump, man, why isn't he Trump? You know, and, and Mike Duncan is basically like, hold, hold on a minute, like, Louis Napoleon was known for putting out all this, all these popular appeals for economic relief. He's like a classic Sorelian demagogue. Yeah. So, well, so and, and he's, he's coming up with all these like, you know, bong rip utopian proposals and trying to get people to look at him as a political figure that would bring those things. Again, I feel like he was really influenced by the St. Simonians, which totally overlaps with his support from finance, right? Because the St. Simonians went into financial speculation after they were socialists. Yeah, they seem to be kind of on the same page in terms of their, like, utopian dreams of social engineering. So that's very different from Trump. Now, did, at any part to Louis Napoleon, did he ever encourage people to inject bleach? <laughs> 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 no, he he wasn't nearly that progressive, Tom. You unlock that in the tech tree, or in the culture tree, I should say, in, uh, in the 21st century. Yeah, where where is the version of socialism we get where, like, it's, you know, that, that uh, glorious ascending trajectory, and then you get the degeneration thesis, and, like, the right. new technologies you're unlocking on the tree are, like snake oil bleach injections for the masses yeah. traditional your nationality here medicine you know all yeah. capitals replacing you know the scientific method okay Let, let's keep going the national assembly flared up repeatedly over these unmistakable attempts to gain popularity at its expense over the growing danger that this adventurer whom his death spurred on and no established reputation held back would venture a desperate coup. The discord between the party of order and the president had taken on a threatening character when an unexpected event threw him back repentant into its arms. We mean the by-elections of March 10th, 1850. These elections were held for the purpose of filling the representative seats that 
after June 13th had been rendered vacant by imprisonment or exile, Paris selected only social democratic candidates. It even concentrated most of the votes on an insurgent of June 1848 on the flot. Thus did the Parisian petty bourgeoisie in alliance with the proletariat revenge itself for its defeat on June 13th, 1849. It seemed to have disappeared from the battlefield at the moment of danger, only to reappear there on a more propitious occasion with more numerous fighting forces and with a bolder battle cry. One circumstance seemed to heighten the peril of this election victory. The army voted in Paris for the June insurgent against La Hitte, a minister of Bonaparte's, and in the departments largely for the Montagnards, who hereto, though indeed not so decisively as in Paris, maintained the ascendancy over their adversaries. Bonaparte saw himself suddenly confronted with revolution once more. As on January 29th, 1849, as on June 13th, 1849, so on March 10th, 1850, he disappeared behind the party of order. He made obeisance. He pusillanimously begged pardon. He offered to appoint any ministry it pleased at the behest of the parliamentary majority. He even implored the Orleanist and Legitimist party leaders, the Tiers, the Berriers, the Bourglis, the Moles, in brief, the so-called Burgraves, to take the helm of the state themselves. The party of order proved unable to take advantage of this opportunity that would never return. Instead of boldly possessing itself of the power offered, it did not even compel Bonaparte to reinstate the ministry dismissed on November 1st. It contented itself with humiliating him by his forgiveness and adjoining Monsieur Baruch to the Haute-Pole ministry. As public prosecutor, this Baruch had stormed and raged before the high court at Borges, the first time against the revolutionists of May 15th, the second time against the Democrats of June 13th, both times because of an attempt on the life of the National Assembly. None of Bonaparte's ministers subsequently contributed more to the degradation of the National Assembly and after December 2nd, 1851. We meet him more as the comfortably installed and highly paid vice president of the Senate. He had spat in the revolutionist soup in order that Bonaparte might eat it up. That is gross. Yeah, it's... That is like something from some weird porno yeah, this, this, some this, scatology this, video or something. Yeah. Desaad or Bataille short story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the M stands for. It's not Monsieur. It's uh, Marquis Baroche. Oh, is it now? No, ah. I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay. No, he's okay, okay. an SM yeah, yeah, yeah. joke. Get with it. So we have the resurgence, there's, there's new elections, new parliamentary elections, and we have a resurgence of the Social Democrats. Lo and behold, they come back roaring into and they take every goddamn seat in Paris. And they say here a majority for the Montagnard, so for the Social Democrats again, out in the, in the departments, which is basically the rural. So the gist was then that like Bonaparte suddenly was on his knees again. Yeah. He was like, he's like, oh, God damn it. I totally misjudge. I, I have to crawl in front of the party of order. And he offered them basically the reins back that like the, the reins that he took from them when he when he dismissed the ministries and put his own men in. He, he said, OK, you can put you can put your stuff back in and I, I, I'll, you can take over the entire run of the country. He, he, he pretty much offered to resign. And they basically all they did is they put one fella in Baroque. And what did Baroque do? Come a year later, he was uh, made, was he vice president of the National Assembly, a position where he got loads of money and he was sitting fat on, the, on, on Napoleon's back. You know, usually in the Marxist tradition, the word petty bourgeoisie is basically kulak, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, like something, you know, very morally, like, degenerate and, and deserves to be eliminated. In Marxist political writings, the petty bourgeoisie often can be found in alliance with the proletariat, but not always. There's an ambivalence, a strategic ambivalence to the petty bourgeoisie that, I mean, I guess it really finds its apex here. And Marx as a whole, especially in his theoretical reflection, in his theoretical reflection on these events, paints the petty bourgeoisie as essentially 
more prone to line up with the reaction because of class interests. But in his political writings, you see these sorts of things a lot that, you know, winning over certain elements of the petty bourgeoisie can indicate the strength of the proletariat. But also it seems like the, that the leaders typically, I don't know if this is historically true here, tend to be from the bourgeois, the petty bourgeoisie in these movements. Yeah. It's nearly always the case in any of like the Labour Party here or the Democrat, it's a lot of the leaders come from petty bourgeois backgrounds. But also in, in the Marxist tradition too. In the yeah. Marxist tradition too. Or uh, properly bourgeois. There's a lot of sort of like semi-aristocratic Marxists out there, you know, uh, come from oh, come from money. Yeah. No, that's true. In the liberal tradition, the people that become bourgeois representatives tend to be kind of rich. But there's this old notion from Aristotle's politics that, no, 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 if you want a truly fair you know, society, of course you don't want a democracy, that would be weird. But um, you want the middle class to run things. And there's a lot of translations of Aristotle that just say middle class there. And of course, in America, if you actually ran the numbers, the political class is not the middle, you know, it doesn't line up with the middle class, like really. It's almost a meaningless concept in America, right? Yeah. Like the, sure. The, sure, the, the sure. spread is so out there. Uh, right, right, right. It's, it's, it's so inflated as to not mean anything. But the point is, is that you don't often have literal like billionaires being the politicians directly. That's seen in liberal democracy as being a sign of corruption and decadence. The idea is you have these like hardworking civil servants, or at least, or at least people that went to a nice law school, wink, wink that actually form the political, executive, legislative, judicial arm. And then, you know, they serve as a check to the actual winners in society. <laughs> I didn't mean the middle class in, the, in that sort of like nebulous ideological. American uh, sense. If you took the median in America in terms of wealth, it's almost a meaningless concept because the spread between the tourists and the richest is so enormous. Like yeah. middle class in the UK, middle class means you're a doctor or a lawyer. That's what the middle class right, means. Right. In America, it's a catch all so that they won't ever have to say the word worker. You know, you ideologically can't say the workers in American politics. Well, you have to say I mean, the middle class. It's kind of true. And, and most people that actually seek to disaggregate the workers from the middle class in American like political life are the right. That's the interesting thing is that for the most part, the word, the phrase middle class did take the place of working class in like other post-war class compromises. It points to, uh, there's something in common with that and like, you know, classical fascism too, actually. Yeah. But getting back here anyway, a little bit to it, like one thing I was kind of trying to get at was that like, if your representatives are going to be petty bourgeois middle class types they're more than likely going to side with law and legalism over revolutionary stuff yeah unless well, they're explicitly a revolutionary and even then and even then they often side often like look at the history of all these communist parties in europe and places like where may 1968 happened they were against that Am I historically wrong again? You're, you're saying like in 68, the middle class leadership were against revolution? The CCP, I'm talking about the the, the, French, oh. the, the French Communist Party. Oh, yeah. Actively worked against the, the masses. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was part, you know, class interest and buy-in in the post-war French order. Yeah. It was also partially like strategic well no but that that those are strategic considerations that i was just describing but it's also partially the sort of post-stalinist party legacy are, are they strategic interests really are you, are you saying their class individual class interests are strategic interests I, I mean listen there was a strategic logic to french like national class compromise that a lot of workers movements especially in the European post-war order, took under various guises. Sometimes, most often it was under a socialist or labor party, but in Italy and in France, notably, it, it happened under the communist party. 
Right. So I oh I just wanted to say that like you know Ezra you're you're saying that like in the political writings Marx is like is a little bit more open about the potential of the petty bourgeoisie to ally or to come over to the side of the proletariat, which is true. But he also did earlier say that like by combining with the proletariat, they poisoned its revolutionary right. energy. That's true. So like it's not really seen in the most positive light, even though it's admitted as a sort of tactical possibility. Yeah, it's more of a sign of strength of the proletariat that the petty bourgeoisie will try to parasite off them. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, if there's anyone in this text who comes off as like the kulaks, it's the lumpen proletariat. It is right? certainly the lumpen. Yeah. Why Why do you say that? Like, are the, the kulaks, are they not the equivalent in a peasant society? No, I, I don't mean it in a literal sense. I mean it in a basically like social waste that needs to be exterminated sense. Yeah. That's the vibe you get off of Marx's take on the, on the lumpen proletariat. Yeah, that's fair. Because if you're going to take on Kulak as a analytic category, which I highly advise against, but if you were (laughs) akin to petty bourgeoisie, you know, like uh, with regards to, you know, the landlord class, then yeah, it's very different than what's being described in Lumpen Proletariat. Erica in the chat just said that we meant the, the PCF. That's what I meant. You know, not the FCA. FCA pay. God knows what the fuck that is. <laughs> Probably a far right organization. Or something. <laughs> An interesting one from the chat here by Guillermo Marquez. He says that the, the Portuguese Communist Party also stopped factory occupations in the 74 revolution to align with Cold War policy. You know, so we see we see that yeah. kind of again and again from quote unquote communist parties g- going against you know being essentially when we look here at the bad influence, the rotting influence of the bo- of the petty bourgeois on the revolutionary aspects of the of the proletariat, we actually see that in itself that type of politics infecting the so called radical communist parties of Europe. For sure, I guess the only thing I'd say is that. The strategic logic basically stays the same whether you are in the Soviet aligned period, you know, before the Euro communist turn. And of course, in uh, France and Italy, that things are a bit more ambivalent during that time because national loyalty, there is a big part of the anti fascist resistance movement that is, you know, loyal to France or Italy as, you know, part of the appeal lining up with, you know, Italian and French national interests kind of made it awkward because they were also in the employ of Moscow at the same time. Was it not dominated, though, by, like, my impression always was that it was dominated more by not wanting to rock the geopolitical boat for the Soviet, the USSR, by take, taking a core country communist. Correct, correct. But that was Stalin's policy, by and large. That ends up being his actual political legacy. It's not like third period, but it's the popular front. And so yeah. that logic that logic holds between the popular front period through the post-war compromise period. And then also after the Euro communist turn, when the communist parties become much more Cold War entities. And a lot of them are turning against Leninism and turning against, you know, the the Soviet world essentially. I, I've got something to throw. I've got something to throw in here to the mix. We we've done our McNair revolutionary strategy series. Um, you know, we talked about sortition for a while. When Cockshot's response, like, how do we defend from a party from getting from turned into what the SPD in Germany turned into? Is there a case for organizational structures to be actually? you know, statistically representative. You have to play a game with different logic than national elections. If you play a game that has a strategic logic of national elections, you're bound to reproduce the same things. You know, it's sort of like what you're describing at the geopolitical level. In the national level, a lot of these communist parties went along with like the theory of monopoly capital, which inherently is about class compromise between like all of the, 
you know, so-called like subaltern classes, right? That's a that's an inherent break on revolutionary action of the proletariat because everybody's just like, well, we did, we you know we just need to get rid of monopoly capital, and then all the workers and the petty bourgeoisie are going to be happy. It's going to be great. Yeah, because that's the case. That's what it was like in Britain in the eighteen hundreds. It was great, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, we got a little sidetracked, but the point is that um, yeah, listen, Marx still has a class interest theory of the petty bourgeoisie. But especially, I guess, in the writings on 1848, because this is the last gasp. This is when liberalism really shows its more reactionary side. And theorists of decadence, you know, will periodize things into a heroic era where something has a historically progressive role. And then a decadent, degenerative era. And if you were going to periodize these things, liberalism really is showing its ass and I should say nationally, because it's always been associated with colonialism. It's showing its ass nationally, showing its reactionary tendencies nationally in 1848. Right. Okay, let's, let's, let's smash on here. Let's talk a little bit about the absolute, ridiculously crap strategy of, I would say kind of on some level understandable, because they got thousands of them got killed in the streets in 1848. You know the June days. It's pretty understanding that the reaction that even if the it was easy for the proletariat and the petty bourgeois to be essentially revolutionary politically, as in vote for maybe a party that may be revolutionary. It's another thing for that party in that class to actually want to bite down again on the actual revolutionary action in the streets. And I think at this point the petty bourgeois national guard has been disarmed because that that happened in the previous demonstrations that's right they well, showed I, up without weapons and then i believe they were disarmed after that yes but I, i'm not sure how quickly they were dis disarmed kyle like were they fully disarmed by this stage yeah i don't know i don't know yeah it just may it may, may factor into the their strategy here too absolutely okay so let's give this a read the Social Democrat Party, for its part, seemed only to look for pretexts to put its own victory once again in doubt and to blunt its point. Vidal, one of the newly elected representatives of Paris, had been elected simultaneously in Strasbourg. Like, what the fuck is going on between guys running in two places? It's happened numerous times so far. <laughs> what the fuck? Is it like in case they don't get represented in one place, they can do it in another one and then they have to have a by-election? Is that, is that what's going on? Had your bets. I don't know. There was like, no, there's one of them. Was it not Thier or somebody was elected in six or seven different places one time? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Maybe they just have like six last names to go around the whole nation. That's probably it. It's like Iceland. And I think in Iceland, only four second names cover like 95% of the population. Oh. There's like Magnuson, there's like <laughs> Sigerson or something, and there's like two others. Ericsson. Kind of like, that's, that's like Klingons, House of Martok. It's you like know, literally is. Rogue. Apparently, they took all the good-looking Irish women. That's the thing that people say in Ireland. That's that's what the I, Icelandic people always told me. Is like, oh yeah, like we like the reason why like people are so uh, ugly in the British Isles is because we took all the good-looking people. That that was a common thing I heard from yeah from Icelandic people when I was hanging out with them. Yeah. <laughs> That they literally would come on raids and they would go through the villages and they would take all the best looking women and then they just go back to Iceland. And oh, it's like, God. apparently a quarter of the genes are, I are Irish or something like that. Can't wait to read the uh, evolutionary, you know, sociology paper on that bar. Yeah. <laughs> mm. uh, let's keep going. Let's, let's get out of this social fascism stuff here now. Where do we, this is, I blame, I blame Kyle. Let's be honest. Okay. Now. <laughs> okay. He was induced to decline the election for Paris and accept it for Strasbourg. And so, instead of making its victory at the polls conclusive and thereby compelling the party of order to contest it in Parliament at once, instead of thus forcing the adversary to fight at the moment of popular enthusiasm and favourable mood in the army, the Democratic Party wearied Paris during the months of March and April with a new election campaign, let the aroused popular passions wear themselves out in this repeated provisional election game. 
let the revolutionary energy satiate itself with constitutional successes, dissipate itself in petty intrigues, hollow declamations and sham movements, let the bourgeoisie rally and make its preparations, and lastly, weaken the significance of, of the March elections by a sentimental commentary in the April by-election, the election of Eugene Sue. In a word, it made an April fool of March 10th. The parliamentary majority understood the weakness of its antagonist. Its 17 borough graves, for Bonaparte had left it to the direction of and responsibility for the attack, drew up a new electoral law, the introduction of which was entrusted to Monsieur Fauché, who solicited his dishonour for himself. On May 8th, he introduced the law by which universal suffrage was to be abolished, a residence of three years in the locality of the election to be imposed as a condition on the electors. And finally, the proof of this residence made dependent in the case of workers on a certificate from their employers. Just as the Democrats had in revolutionary fashion raged and agitated during the constitutional election contest, so now, when it was requisite to prove the serious nature of that victory, arms in hand, did they in constitutional fashion preach order, calm, majestu, lawful action, that is to say, blind subjection to the will of the counter-revolution, which imposed itself as the law. During the debate, the mountain put the party of order to shame by asserting against the latter's revolutionary passion the dispassionate attitude of the Philistine who keeps within the law, and by felling that party to earth with the fearful reproach that it was proceeding in a revolutionary manner. Even the newly elected deputies were at pains to prove their decorous and discreet action. What a misconception it was to decry them as anarchists and construe their election as a victory for revolution. On May 31st, the new electoral law went through. The Montagne contented itself with smuggling a protest into the president's pocket. I, I feel like I should have said the, pe the president's pants. The, elect the electoral law was followed by a new press law by which the revolutionary newspaper press was entirely suppressed. It had deserved its fate. The National and La Presse, two bourgeois organs, were left after this deluge as the most advanced outposts of the revolution. Yeah, so I think the thing that really goes against the sort of like, I don't want to say excuses, but the justifications for their inaction that you mentioned before, Tom, is that they did have the army on their side and they didn't take advantage of that. Like there was a significant portion of the army that was on their side, not just the petty bourgeois National Guard. And they pissed that away. Yeah, and that's a massive thing because the army were never really on their side in any of the revolutions. Parts, the French parts, were they? Like, uh, I mean, no, the they, they went episode. back and forth. Like yeah. Marx describes how they go back and forth, but they eventually are like, fuck these guys. Like, let's just throw in with Bonaparte because... Like they're 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 useless. They're hopeless. Yeah, but I mean, like, say, in the early, the first French Revolution and all that period, like the revolutionary times, the, the army never went really on the side of the, you know, the revolution. Did it in the early parts? Like, oh, in the early parts, yeah. You know, like, but... it's in the part where the revolution was trying to get it uh, get into power. Like in those situations, the army was pretty much always on the side of the ruling class. Like this is a this is like kind of a yeah because like they were paid mercenaries. It was a very different army than uh, <laughs> than the one that existed after the revolution. Yeah, but like the army never came out in eighteen forty eight on the side. It basically did it stay neutral when the national guard came out. There's definitely a passage in here where Marx describes how they occasionally would throw their support behind the revolution. And then be extremely disappointed by it. I can't remember exactly where that passage was, but he definitely does address that. That like their loyalties in this period of political chaos were not exclusively with the bourgeoisie or with Napoleon. There were different factions of the army that would, you know, side with one one part or the other. And the ones who sided against the party of order 
were deported to Algeria or wherever. Basically, they got their their stationing in Alaska to sort of like waste away in obscurity. Harsh. So like there were there were like political punishments for those sections of the army that were revolutionary. It does remind me this whole section of how like the new enthusiasm of the the voters for some revolutionary action was betrayed by their leaders and representatives. There is kind of something of like 2008 and Obama in that. It's hard to not see it. It's hard to see that, you know, hmm. let oh, yeah. them try and like, it seems to be the same as it ever was. The, the pardoning of all of the uh, Bush era crimes by Obama, I think is very consonant with this. Or even like, you know, the thing of having one economic team advising them during the election and then got rid of them all and brought in the Wall Street boys, which was obviously known by all the Wall Street people at the time. Everybody yeah. must have known it. And also in his health care stuff, oh, yeah. the public option immediately off the table. Yeah, whipping you know, whipping that basically like crushing anyone who was advocating a public option. Yeah. It, it was a little more complicated than that because the public option was actually something that he campaigned on and to an extent, I don't want to say fought for, but he made a show of fighting for it, which points to this, like the way that Republicans and Democrats let down their voters is different. Republicans have a party line. They have a program in normal times, I should say. They used to have a bit of Leninism about them. They were capable of getting legislation through. The Democrats use a sort of, I'm just being a nice guy posture inside the legislature to let down its voters in a functional way, <laughs> right? They also have the blue dogs to blame their failures on, right? Right. And so the public option was just such a thing. Now, if they actually blamed their failure on them in an active way, use the presidency as the, quote, bully pulpit to kind of, you know, get their party in line and like, or even just use regular parliament, parliamentary, even use regular legislative like whips in, in a normal, effective way that you would see on Yes Minister or something like, <laughs> or I'm sorry, that you would see on the British uh, House of Cards. Like, you know, they, they could actually accomplish a lot more, but they use their weakness as an excuse. It's, it's, it's by design. It's totally by design. It's clearly a functional kind of weakness. It was one of the things that really got me to accept this concept of like, you know, a functional explanation that like you see this correlation, you see the behavior, you see the outcome. You're not sure how you actually get from point A to point B, but you know that one is causing the other. You know, the, the effect like will select for a cause and then have it be caused. It's an attempt to describe like, you know, something systemic that can happen in more than one way. I think, yeah, the, the old adage of look what people do and not what they say, that, that's how you understand people's motives. You know, maybe on the individual level, somebody can be blind to their own motives, but not in a big strategic operation like a party like that. How reactionary. You want to look at revealed preferences? Oh, my God. And not focus on <laughs> their symbolic, you know, life? My word. <laughs> I, I'm kind of unsure whether I... that it, I'm, not, I'm not sure what side of the joke I land on there. Explain. Oh, no, you're... People flap their gums for all, about all kinds of things. You see what they actually do. So ironically, like, the point is that the left doesn't like to think strategically, like, in the contemporary sense of using no. like you know strategic modeling it's not something you come across any type of decent strategic thought very often yeah i would i would say that's also by design because you know if you know you're playing a game and a bunch of your new recruits don't know it that helps you <laughs> Thank you.
On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. (laughs) 